Hello, and welcome to I Am Dad Podcast with your fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. 30 minutes of wisdom, information, resources, and nuggets to help you on your fatherhood journey. Or maybe you're just curious and want to hear some real talk about fatherhood, family, and the minds of men. Well, guess what? We got you too. Sit back, grab your pad and pen, and maybe even bring a little something to sip on. Enjoy 30 straight minutes of fatherhood, family, and fun with the fatherhood authority. Kenneth Braswell. Welcome to I Am Dad Podcast. I'm your host, Kenneth Braswell. And again, I am thankful for each and every one of you who have supported um, this podcast over the last month or so. Um, It has been incredible. Your feedback has been incredible. Um, Your suggestions have been incredible. Your comments have been incredible. All of that stuff um, just works to make a better conversation around responsible fatherhood. I have no shortage of like dynamic people, friends, brothers, sisters around the country that I've been working with for years, incredible people in their own right, doing this work um, at a phenomenal pace in phenomenal places um, in much needed and critical um, domains around the country and no domain more important to many of our communities, particularly communities of color than that with our incarcerated population, both um, current incarcerated individuals as well as returning citizens back into their communities. And this dude here, and I have such a big heart for him um, and his wife, um, Ron and Kathy um, Tergino, and uh, t- pronounce your name right for me because I say Tergina. Am I right? No, you are not right, but you're close, you know. Get it, so get it for if me. You say it in English. If you say it in English, it's like sports arena, but tierina. But in Spanish, it's tiharina. Tia. That are tiharina. Tiharina. You know, I yeah, got. Yeah. I come from Brooklyn, so I got. I can do a Spanish accent. Don't 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 sleep on me. I can throw it out there, but I have to practice. I can hear it. I can hear it. You can hear it. I have to practice it, it a couple out. of times to like really, really get it, get it. But I'm such a a stickler on making sure that you know you pronounce. My mother always says, um, you know, if nothing else happens for you in life, make sure people pronounce your name correctly. Um, That's right. And it was crazy because there's a I don't know if you're a Star Trek fan. Oh, um, oh yeah. Are you a Star Trek I'm fan? Captain, I'm Captain Kirk. In fact, man, let me I'm in my office right now. <laughs> Star Trek. I mean, I mean, look, you just mentioned Star Trek. I don't know if you've been able to see this. If it, you know, this is my uh oh, you got the, oh. you got the <laughs> communicator. <laughs> look, I mean, boy, I, I'm just saying, I say, boy, I just put me. <laughs> so I love was, Star Trek, man. So, so there was an episode. We we have to come back to this conversation then and talk about Star <laughs> Trek. But there was an episode um, in the early um, season of Enterprise with Captain Picard. I love Captain Kirk, but I have become a Picard. Okay, generation. All right, Picard. next generation. Um, but there was an episode when the the doctor at the time was talking to Data, and she kept calling him Data. And he kept yeah. saying, my name is Data. Remember that episode? He says, my name is I Data. I do. And she said, <laughs> what's the problem? What's the difference? And his response floored me. And his response was, one is my name, one isn't. And I was well, like, yeah, that's whoa. it. whoa. And it was literally like all of my kids, particularly my youngest girl, whose name is Nzinga, which is Angolian. Like people will mm. always want to shorten her name to Zinga or in or whatever. And I would always tell her, you have one name that we gave to you. And that was in Zynga. Never, ever allow anyone to call you something that is not your given name. And even as a young child, like two or three, she would correct people. I said, and don't give them space. She, I said, the minute they pronounce it, say, that's not my name. My name is in Zynga. And she would like two or three years old, correct people. The, the power of a name, you know, um, I, and, and we're going to talk more about my story here. And I know we in a little bit, you know, we talked about incarceration. I met a guy in prison. And, and so one of the things I practiced when I was in prison, and I got to learn about uh, etymology, right? And, and you know, where words come from and the names. And, and so I sat across the, uh, the chow hall once in front of a guy. And you triggered this, so let me go with it. Um, 
And on his name tag, you know, you got your inmate number and your name, and your last name. And this guy's last name was literally terrible. Wow. That was his last name. And I looked at it. I'm like, holy moly, what, what, in, 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 what in life did your family do to inherit that name? Right. And, and he, he thought about it. He said, well, you know what? I don't know what they did, but I know what I did. That's what he said mm -hmm. to me. Right. I mean, can you imagine going around life and your last name is, and this is what they called you, terrible. Right. Well, what you did was you lived out your destiny. Mm. Because that's what they call you. That's why you don't let anyone mispronounce your name because the legacy that they're placing upon you by calling you something that mm -hmm. you're not manifests something in you that doesn't exist and not is supposed to be there. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, and we, you know, we can, we can play. This mm -hmm. is my podcast, which is why I love, I can say whatever I want to say and frame it any way I want to say it. God intends for you to live out that destination that was given to you. Like you don't That's allow right. people to rename who you are because there is something mm. about a parent naming their child, right? That is a huge responsibility. And we know- That's a forgotten, that, right. that's a forgotten practice, I think, even in our society today where the importance of a name and even, in, you know, I, when I, my sons are now, you know, they're adults now. My oldest son is Blake. My youngest son is Brandon. You know, and thinking, you know, in that line, but not really understanding the importance of a name. My name, for example, is Ron, <laughs> right? It does, it's nothing, you know, my parents, when they named it, they named it after my dad said it, one of his best friends. He loved that name. It was his great friend. And he named me after that. But I think today, in today's society, we don't stop to think about the type of rites of passage, watching the birth of a child and waiting for that spirit of the child to be manifested. And that's how you name it. I, you know, I'm, my ancestors are from, from Mexico are, and my mom's side are Apache. My dad's side are Spaniards. But if I go back in history, which I have, and seeing that there used to be a great importance on a name. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, is so part of that. And you're right, we, I done got all the way away from what we're going to, well, we're going to get to what we're going to talk about, the core of what we're going to talk about. But this is so yeah. cool because it actually is important in the space of the work that you do, particularly when men, feel like they're lost and they're looking for direction mm. and they don't know who they are. That's a That's critical right. component, right? Of being a father. And what you and I are talking about is the importance of a father being present in the life of his child so that not only do him and the mom establish what they're going to call their children, but to be in place to make sure that they manifest what they saw in them. Right. So oh, that's so we ain't off base. So for people listening, we're not off base from the conversation. This is perfect. This is exactly what we're talking about. Right. This is just a, this is just a critical component that often gets overseen when we're talking to folks. That's why I heard you tell the story. Um, and I've heard you tell your story a ton of times and I was telling Kathy in Salt Lake City, we were talking and she was like, she was just saying, thank you so much for coming to your workshop and I was like that's that's I'm gonna do that that's that's who I am. you guys are special to me I'm like yes mm -hmm. I'm going to show up but I was telling him I hate coming to your workshop because y'all make me cry every time mm. I your story over I, I don't, I've heard it a hundred times and I cry every time because it's the emotional connect to where mm -hmm. you were to where you are that's what I resonate with and I don't know if people get that when they're listening to you and I believe they do but I've heard you on seven occasions talk about remembering your inmate number right mm -hmm. every and and that stuck in your mind and that being your designation right we're talking about Star Trek right your designation yeah. you know one blah 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 of blah blah whatever the big number was and that you having to leave that designation behind in order to take on who you truly needed to be that's right you know I have a saying that your past doesn't define who you are but it will qualify you for something greater if you let it and you learn from it mm -hmm. and that, that's what our history my story is about right not letting it own me as a father as a husband as a man of honor a man somebody worth following because even though I was innocent what I was convicted of I still found myself in prison because why I couldn't be taken at my 
word. Mm. And I didn't understand that growing up. You know, I mean, I knew, you know, my, my parents, they did the best they could, but I never understood the responsibility that comes from when you, when you have a name and how, how, wanna, how you want to cherish that name, that honor that comes, you know, how are you going to live your legacy today? Is, you know, we're always talking about building a legacy for our tomorrow, but what about living a legacy for today? What do people say about you today? Well, I couldn't be taken at my words, so I went up going to prison. And, and let me show you something here. I'm going to grab a prop, right? And this mm -hmm. is you know, a prop that's real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm in my office. Can you still hear me? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Because you mentioned you, the, you mentioned the number in our past, so I, I want to share this with your audience. And this is, this is my prison blues. Wow. Now, when you were in my office, it's literally a caddy corner, almost directly behind me, but just to the left of me. Uh, when facing the desk, is hanging this uniform. Now, I walked out of prison totally free, no probation, no parole, nothing. The, the, the judge let me go. Now, this is my past, mm -hmm. but also part of my past is I when I got out, now there's a little bit more to my story than just this. I had to turn myself back in because the Court of Appeals overturned my release, so I had to do another four and a half years before the governor finally got me out. And then I still had to do parole. They gave me two years parole. So if you were sitting right here where I'm at and you're looking directly across my desk and to my wall, you will see my certificate of release. In other words, from parole. Mm -hmm. And I have that framed. So in my past, I see the things that held me back. Mm -hmm. But in front of me, I see the future, which is my freedom. And this is as a father, as a parent, something that I was constantly pouring into my sons and my daughter as they come to visit me, my wife, our family. Look, this doesn't this doesn't define who we are. We're mm -hmm. just passing through. This is part of our story, but it isn't the end of our story. Right, right, right. And it's so critical to, you know, pay attention to um, the um, awareness, presence of perseverance, right? Being able to press on beyond those things that oppress you and hold you back those baggages that we carry from our past it's also very difficult for those who do this work and i'm gonna take a quick step back because i really want people to kind of know what you do um, ron and his wife kathy is the co-founder and they oversee the ridge project in ohio throughout the country, but the Ridge Project in the state of Ohio, and the two of them do some incredible work um, with not-for-profits and agencies, but more specifically with the prison system in Ohio. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal work. Um, they are both the creators of a curriculum called Tyro, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I just wanted to kind of give people that backdrop so they can see where this conversation led you, the work that it led you to. Um, but when we talk about uh, perseverance, right? And so this is a conversation and I'll bring you back and I got to bring you and Kathy back at the same time so we can have these conversations because I think one of the things that's missing in the responsible fatherhood field are the, are the stories that fuel this work, right? Mm -hmm. Almost everyone that I have a sincere fondness for, including you and Kathy and others in this field, I know your story. And so when I'm out there doing this work, I carry your stories with me. So when I'm talking to an individual who has come home from incarceration, I'm carrying your story with me and it helps me serve that person or it helps me speak to that person. Absolutely. Or I have someone to call to ask the question on how I deal with this person and what should I be thinking about as I'm talking to this person. And I think we often disconnect the myriad of stories that are attached to men like yourself who have been through it, right? And come through it, still going through other measures of life because you're never, never done with going through, right? We're always mm -hmm. going through, but who have gone through a significant um, part of their life to get to their destiny. And I know that, you know, often people have probably asked you the question, if you would have done anything different in your life, would you have done it? And with all that you've gone through and you reflect on where you are today, your question, your answer has to be, you know what? Nothing. 
you know, and that's, that's so true. Cause you know, if, had it not been for that experience, I could only imagine, you know, I, I'd be divorced. I could be six feet under. I would, I don't know where my sons would be, but it's those, those dark valleys that you find yourself in where, you know, we, we look at, uh, for example, uh, the wildfires that take place in nature, right. And, and all these big uh, state parks that happen and people see the devastation that's taking place. But when the fire is done, when it's over, then you see new life happen. You see more beauty than before take place, these new growths, these new opportunities. But that's the same thing with our lives. When we, we are living an experience of a wildfire and, and it's out of control, and then all of a sudden we get shut down. And then mm -hmm. if we allow, and, and, and I appreciate what you said, when we allow God to, to really take control, we take the reins, and we begin to change the way, to change the way we, we see life and the way we think, and really begin to absorb the life lessons that we're supposed to learn in the midst of what we think is supposed to keep us down, that's where the growth takes place. Mm -hmm. When you can be still and you can listen and you can learn not only from your past mistakes, but from what you're able to experience mm -hmm. so that you never have to experience that lesson again. The reason why people go back to prison back and forth, dads, I mean, this is crazy. How come there, there's such a there's 66 percent after three years of incarceration, 66 percent of people go back to prison. And mm -hmm. I believe it's because they didn't acquire and embrace the experience that they were having in that moment. They didn't learn the lessons that they could have grabbed a hold of and took with them when they left the penitentiary. Because mm -hmm. had they done that, they wouldn't have to repeat the grade again. Because right. people get held back from school all the time, not because they didn't know this stuff, because they didn't do it. Right. When you think about this work of reentry, talk a little bit, because a lot of folks don't even understand or even know that there's a body of work out there specifically for um, incarcerated individuals and person who are, persons who are coming home from incarceration. Talk a little bit about reentry work and what is it and um, what they should know about it. Well, that, that's a great, that's a great uh, topic, great question. You know, when you, when you think about what is reentry work, reentry work is, is just that helping somebody reenter to a, from one place to another, mm. right? Entry level positions, you know, when you think about the workplace, you got levels of, of uh, places in, excuse me, in the factory, right? Mm -hmm. Entry level to foreman level supervisors, all the way up to the white shirts, right? From the, for the guys in the administration. Well, same thing in life, right? So you got grown people. Right. I'd say grow men. I, I work with men, but we also have a women's division, but I don't work with none of the women. Men work with men. Women work with women. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is a saying uh, we say grown men with little boy issues. Right. Because you're dealing with trauma. We're trying to deal with this just trauma informed care. This thing that's been talked around the United States for now. That's a new phrase, if you will, mm -hmm. is really how do you bring healing to somebody who's been hurting since they were a child and from a child never dealt with something that they experienced. And then they go into the adult life, but they really still have that pain that they bring it into it and never dealt with it. So you got to really understand that when you're working with reentry, you're helping somebody redefine themselves reinvent themselves, recognize what got them there and help them rebuild the relationships and really their character of something that they destroyed. And once you get them to that place, now you can help them to reinvent themselves. And once they get there, now they can begin to reinvest because the truth is everybody wants to be validated. Even mm -hmm. people who have never been incarcerated, they want to be seen. We want to, we know, we want to be recognized. That's human nature. We don't want to be uh, shunned or rejected or objectified and, and thrown at in, from society's eyes as disposable. We want to be empowered. Everybody would love to be an influencer, but not everybody's willing to do the work, right, to become that influencer. So when you're working with men in prison or families who are trying to reenter society from getting off of food stamps, welfare system, that entitlement mentality, sometimes you got to take off the gloves. You, you don't own a violin. They are ready for the real McCoy. They want to hear the truth. What does it take to be successful? Because we all have dreams and the most powerful antidote anyone can give to anybody who's in that situation is hope. And that's what people like me and people like you and those that are in this line of work, that's the bottom line what we're bringing to a family that's in this, this state of dysfunction. Maybe society has deemed them disposable. 
We're going to bring them hope. And once hope is ignited in somebody, because we all know what it means to walk in hope. We've been there down and out, sad, or maybe it may be just, just uh, experienced a lot of trauma. But once hope is ignited, we can begin to lift our head up. We, we begin to see a better future for ourselves, a better tomorrow. And that's what reentry work is all about, igniting hope in others. Yo, you know, one of the things I was just thinking about as you were using those terms, uh, reentry, reinvent, um, re, you know, all of the, those, those terms you were using. Um, I think the piece of those words that we often forget about and we don't take serious is the prefix re, right? Re literally means doing something over that you've already done, mm -hmm. right? Which means that you got to go back to a place and you got to start over again. And I think one of the frustrations that society has with individuals that are coming home from incarceration is that we don't have the patience for their re. Mm -hmm. We don't have the patience to wait for them to go back and come back through again. We want them to come in the way we expect them to come in or the way they should have come in before but don't take the time to have the level of patience and compassion for the, for the re journey that this individual has to take mm. to get back to where we want. Do you see that in the dads that you work with? You know what? I, I see that in a lot of with society, you know, because I mean, if you're working with individuals that maybe they got three or four prison numbers, or maybe they've been on welfare for six, four, five generations, right? And maybe they've been in and out of jobs. They can't seem to hold a job. Well, you know, people begin to become stoic when, mm -hmm. okay, there comes Johnny again. You know what he's about. He's going to come in here. He's going to use somebody. He's going to do it all over again, right? Because practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And mm -hmm. this is the thing that we teach with our dads. So if you've been, you know, you, you can't hold a job down. You're practicing those same negative behaviors that keep ending you up broke, keep ending you up unemployed, keep you ending you up uh, on the streets or whatever that might be. So we got to come in and help change the way they think, right? And back to the reinventing. Let's change something about you. Let's practice something different, something more positive. But the problem is they don't know how to activate these principles like integrity, mm. honesty, honor. They really don't practice those things. They're practicing cutting corners, mm. right? How can I get over on this person? This is what they've been practicing for so long because they believe this negative thing that everybody is out to get me. And if you have that mindset where everybody's judging me, nobody cares about me. It's all about who? It's all about me. Then you walk around with this entitlement mentality. And if that's how you live, the other people on their side they get tired of it. They get tired of you. They get, they're not going to believe in you. They lose, they lose hope in you mm -hmm. because you keep practicing the same negative behavior. And we can understand that. But our job is to take both sides. I said, okay, listen, they're only doing what they know how to do. Mm -hmm. Everything that we've been describing in how to become a man or a woman of honor, a person of virtue, somebody of good character, somebody worth following, this is learned behavior. Because nobody had to teach us how to lie, right? When we were kids, we knew how to lie. Mm -hmm. But somebody had to take time to teach us how to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's like growing up in life. Somebody has to tell us and encourage us. Look, we want you to get up on time. We want you to show up and work on time. We want you to do your job and then some. And then some. Man, I'm only going to do what I'm paid for to do. And they better be glad I showed up. Yeah. That's the attitude, right? Yeah. We want to change and shift that attitude. So when an employer gives somebody a second chance, right? Third chance, fourth chance at a job. They got the new mindset. You know what? I'm going to go in this job, not acting like I'm doing them a favor. I'm going to go in this job for the first time and looking at myself as a contractor, not as an employee, as a contractor, because as a contractor, I want to renew, get my contract renewed when every day. Wow. If I can think like a contractor, I want to get another contract from this company. That means I better show up, shut up and show out. And that's what we teach these individuals. It's all about the individual taking responsibility. How do you want people to see you is how you demonstrate how you want to be. Yeah, you know, my belief is that reentry work should start when they go in, not when they come out. That's exactly right. Right? That's it. Because you talked about the other side, and I want you to speak a little bit about the work with the other side, because that work is as critical 
um, as it is with the individual itself. Um, I'll tell you a short story and then I want you to kind of talk to me about what that work looks like or what it should look like or what sh we should be considering when we think about reentry work. And on a the conference that we just did with the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse, you weren't on this particular panel discussion uh, with the fathers. You were on a, which y'all panel was uh, incredible too. And if you want to hear that, um, conversation with um ron and uh, who was the co i can't remember who was on there with you um, i can't remember either, patrick, but it was a great ron one. patrick and i can't remember who but anyway if you want to see that go to um fatherhood.gov and you can see all of the presentations but anyway on the one that we were on the gentleman was talking about how he came home after 32 years hmm. um, and being so conditioned um to only be around people for one to two hours a day and when he got home he realized that his family wanted to smother him and be on him and love on him and do all those things and after about an hour or so he started feeling a certain way and he had to get away from them and he said they thought that he was trying to get away from what they were trying to do to him and what he was trying to describe was that has been his habit for 32 years or so. I can't remember the exact number, but he was saying that he just was not comfortable with being around people for any length of time because that wasn't his narrative. And I had never heard that before. I'd never heard someone speak about that particular issue with respect to actually being around people because the reentry work can oftentimes be dominated by us wanting to force him into community and force him into families and force him into his kids' lives and force him into employment and force him into services around people that he has to be with for a considerable amount of time throughout the day where this individual is not conditioned to be around people like that. When you think about that work with the other side of with employers, with families, with community, with practitioners, who clearly don't understand that concept. How does that work take place? How do we begin to do the work that we need to do with the other side to ease the transition for our um, um, coming, our returning citizens? You know, that's a great question. You know, to really bring awareness. Um, you hear a lot about military uh, personnel who come um, from overseas, maybe they were in Afghanistan or those, those hot spots, and they got what they call P. PSDT, what is that called? Can yep, you got it. PSD. PST, yep. mm -hmm. right? And um, that's the same thing with this population. When you've been isolated for so long and then all of a sudden you're thrust into a society or to a community or to your family where you're being bombarded with all these, uh, you're overwhelmed, your senses are overwhelmed and you got to come to a place of balance and, and peace within yourself and be able to center yourself to not let that overtake you, mm -hmm. right? Because in prison, you only get one choice of peanut butter, right? <laughs> and you only get one choice of bread, one choice of this when you're going to the commissary or to the grocery store, right? To buy your, your groceries, right? Now you come outside, you go into Kroger's, you go into a Walmart, you got, you're overwhelmed with all these choices. Right. Well, can you imagine how you're being thrust with your family and your family don't understand. They weren't there in that experience. They were loving on you while you were doing your time, but now you come out. Now they really want to smother you with love and, and, and they don't understand that a person like this, and I'm talking about myself, you know what, after serving 15 years, you know, I need, I need a little space because I can't breathe. Mm, right. I can't breathe. You know, I remember the first night when I was laying there, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in bed with my wife and I had just got home. I'd been incarcerated 11 and a half years and I laying down that morning, somebody for whatever reason called around 730 in the morning. This is when everybody had landlines. Mm -hmm. So we had a landline and the phone rang. It's 730. I jumped up like, oh, I panicked. And, mm -hmm. and Kathy was like, what's, what's, what's the matter? Well, we got to answer. We got to answer. She said, no, we don't. Right. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I, I'm a light sleeper now because of my experience in there. Mm -hmm. I hear a noise in the house. I'm awake. Right. And so and so the trauma and the experience that a person has, we, we actually sit with some employers. We sit with family members. We talk to them and we try to help them and coach them along the way. Do not take it personal if they want to be alone for a little while. Mm -hmm. Let them get acclimated with what's 
what they're being hit with, right? It's like, a, and I don't know what it's like, but can you imagine if you were in a coma? You know, like the movie Captain America, right? He, they found him frozen from World War II. He wakes up and it's present day. And they put, they, they try to uh, trick him. Mm -hmm. It was still 1941 or 42. Mm -hmm. So they put him in a room and put everything back in that era. And he figured it out, something's wrong here. And he, his environment wasn't real. Instead of being real with them and just letting him acclimate slowly, hey, we're gonna show you what, where you've been. And what, they tried to, uh, they were trying, they thought they were doing good, but really it wound up hurting him more. Cause now, now I don't trust you cause you've lied to me for the last two weeks that I've been in here. Right, absolutely. Right? And so we wanna be honest with the people that are taking care of the guys and the women that are coming home. But really, they gotta have. They can't take it personal if if uh, they want to be alone for a little while. If they want to go for a walk, you know what? I know you mean well. I know I know you want us to do this, but hey, can we just slow it down? Mm -hmm, just a little mm -hmm. bit, because mm -hmm. when you're in prison, it's like the military. Hurry up and wait, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing in that world. But now, can you imagine? Imagine this, Kenneth. Imagine this. How big the world is. Now let's. You're, you're living in a micro universe that's called the prison. And in this prison, it's maybe 15, maybe 20 acres, maybe bigger than that, right? But even in, they say it was even 50 acres, this prison was, this complex. But in those 50 acres, you're only allowed to walk from point A to point B. And point A to point B is only amount of three acres. Mm -hmm. And so this is for the last 10 years, you could only walk on from point A to point B, and that is the equivalent of three acres for the last 15 years. That's all you can walk. You, If you leave this perimeter right here, you're considered out of place and you're in violation. And you can go to the hole. You can get a ticket. You can get in, you can get in serious trouble. If you walk beyond this boundary, and it's only three acres on a 50-acre camp compared to the entire world, and you've wow. been walking for three acres for 15 years. Wow. Wow. I mean, think about that. Yeah. That's all you can go. And you're eating the same thing each and every day, seeing the same stuff on your little TV. You get a little 13 inch TV in your room. Mm -hmm. That's it. Doing the same things. See, rehabilitation is really with that individual. He's got to make it happen. And if we can help take that family and start to help them understand the process of what rehabilitation really takes place and what it looks like and help them prepare for when mom or dad comes home. They're not, they don't feel discarded. They don't feel disrespected or dishonored because they have a total understanding of how they have to, you're not being, you're not being soft. You're not, you don't have a patient, you right? somebody, but, but you do have somebody whose stimulants are just overpowered right. and overwhelmed with what's happening out here. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a story and narrative that, you know, again, you know, there are several different conversations I want to have with you, which is why I'll be bringing you back and back and back. Cause we only have like five minutes to go. Um, and I want you to talk wow, about already over. Yeah. I want you to talk about Tyro, <clears throat> but I want to let people know that there's two very specific conversations that I want to have with you because it's a conversation that doesn't take place often. And that is, like the role of your wife in that journey. You talked about getting up and her having the set of mind to say, whoa, whoa, calm down. It's, you know, and explaining that to you and you trusting her enough to understand that you were safe in, in her space and yeah. her role in, 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 in navigating a journey for you that allowed you to re-enter, right? Because your re-entry didn't didn't end in a program it started in the midst of being in the space that you were supposed to be in and the second thing um is the story of your son um your children but particularly your son and the narrative around how he even had to struggle with the position that he had to take hold of while you were gone mm -hmm. and having to release or feeling comfortable with releasing that space back to you and sometimes the battle that can happen between father and son with respect to relative positions in the family yes. and oversight and roles that we um attune to for our kids to have and you said something like so i mean i cried every time you said this but i heard you say it again last time and it was like Listen, I just want you to be a kid again. Like you gotta mm -hmm. stop wanting to be a man. 
Like you gotta be a kid. Like you gotta embrace just being a kid and not having responsibilities and getting in a little trouble and meeting a bunch of girls and hanging out at parties and yep. or doing what you want to do because you want to do, not doing what you want to do because you feel like you have to do it because the person yep. who you believe should be doing this is not capable of doing that. Yep. That is a heavy, heavy burden on a child. No, no, no child should have to outgrow their parents. Right. Right, because I was still a child, even though I went to prison, I'm a grown man with little boy issues, right? I said that earlier. And here now my son, I'm going to prison and now he's got to man up and become the man of the house. And, and he feels this obligation, this duty, but, but, but yet he still wants to play with little cars. But mm. now he has, he says that sense, I got, I can't play with little cars. I got to be the protector. I got to be the warrior. Right. Mm. right. I got to be the warrior for this family. Right. Because no one else is here. My dad's not here. My little brother's counting on me and I got to protect my mama. And you're 10 years old. Right. What 10 year old is supposed to think like that? Right. That's, that's me robbing my sons of their innocence. Right. Right. And that's what I did. Right. Mm -hmm. Robbed them of their innocence of getting to be a child. Now you got to grow up and be that warrior. And without no rites of passage, no training, right? right? No understanding. This mantle was on you. You know, wow. you mentioned Kathy, and I, I think about the journey of her and I growing up, her visiting me for 15 years. Kathy and I were married five years before I went to prison, but for 15 years, she came to visit me every month, no matter what, what prison they sent me. I was able to, she was able to come and visit me and bring my sons. That in and of itself is a miracle. Mm. And yeah. to grow with me and to, to allow me to speak life into her, her anger, her being resentful for me, for disappointing her, for finding myself in this place. Because I'm going to tell you, when, when Kathy got up against the wall, she rose up to the occasion. The repo man, you know, showed up when I was home, never showed up when she was taking care of the hell. All the bills were paid. She stepped up. She became a strong, powerful. They, they call her Wonder Woman because they wondered how she did it. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah. Because she met all the obligations that a healthy person should meet. Right. Right? right. And that meant I had to get out of the picture so her greatness could come out because I was in the way of that happening. But then as I was growing up in prison, she's growing up out here. Right. God, when it was time, OK, now you're too ready to come together to build what I called you to build. And that's right. where the rich project came. Yeah, I was, you know, we got we at time now and I was like, wow, there's so many more things I want you to touch on, but I do want you to touch on this. And then I want you to just tell folks how to get in touch with you. We'll come back and we'll deal and talk about Tyro um, specifically at another time. But I want you to address this because someone posed this to me some time ago and I answered the question, um, but I've been intending to ask other people to see how they would respond to the question itself. And the question was, Doing this work, this work of responsible fatherhood, and particularly the work that you do um, with the reentry population, is it possible to do this work without including the conversation of faith? Mm. You know, um, we're a Christian organization, but we teach secular curriculum. And what I learned was while I was incarcerated, Everybody has met, and I'm a Christian, so I'll use that term. Everybody, everybody has has heard of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Because when you first go to the county jail, one of the first things everybody gets to see is a little Gideon Bible. Mm. So everybody's heard him, but nobody's met him. Not everybody gets to meet him. Why? So we don't proselytize. We don't preach Jesus. We don't preach that. We become what we teach, mm -hmm. right? So if you're at the question is, can you do it without having faith, you become the book. If you believe really in what you're teaching and you're delivering, then you become the expert in your field. Why? Because you become the principles you're conveying and empowering other people. Because you can't con a con man. <laughs> you can't stole the stole man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they will know you by the fruit you bear. Mm -hmm. So they'll know, they'll know if you're doing this for a paycheck, They'll recognize that game, recognize game, right? You've heard these sayings, mm -hmm. right? But if you do it because you're sincere and you really want to see change, they recognize that and they'll see that. So can you do this without faith? You have to have the faith 
And I'm a Christian, so I believe I'm a born again Christian. So that's how I practice my faith. Mm. But do I got to preach Jesus? I learned in prison, don't preach me, be me. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. My thing is always you have to believe in something. You have to, when you talked about hope earlier, um, hope is the belief in something. And yep. without hope, you have no way of believing in anything. And you can't live this life without believing in something including yourself, right? And so that's just, um, it's, it's a, I always say it's a tragedy um, for the community or an individual that has lost faith or lost belief in anything. Um, that's a dangerous person. A person it is. Who, that's a dangerous person, a person who doesn't believe in anything because uh, he has no guardrails, has no boundaries, has no morals. That's right values and that person is apt to do anything um and so ron tell people how they can get in touch with you um you can contact me through my email ron at the ridge project.com or you can call me hey my my phone number is open 419-439-3025 419-439-3025 i'm a texter you ever want to talk got any questions for me um i'm 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 an open book, um, or you can contact the Ridge Project at theridgeproject.com and ask for me there, theridgeproject.com. And our company phone number is 419-789-00092. So 419-789-0092. I think that's right. So yeah. um, again, theridgeproject.com, Tyro, that's the curriculum we created. Real quick, what that, what that means is it's spelled T-Y-R-O, and that's not an acronym. It's actually a Latin word that means apprentice, novice, someone learning something new, a warrior. And that's what we teach, how to fight for your legacy. Wow. So listen, if you are listening and you want to do this work, want to help in this work, want to create this work, um, you need to talk to this man. There's a lot of folks out there to talk to, but you got to talk to this individual before you step into this work um because this work is not for the faint at heart like this is you know we often use this term in our space um this is not hard work this is heart work and if you don't have the heart for these individuals that you're working with step away from the step away from the mic because you're only going to do more damage um, than you're going to do help if you're working, if you're walking to this space because you think it's a trendy thing to do. Because I think a lot of people are in this space because they believe it's a trendy thing to do. Um, and this is not about keeping up with trends. This is about establishing um, life's journey for individuals who want to do the right thing um, and be there for their families. Ron, thank you so much. Um, awesome. Those of you who are listening, make sure you join us each and every Sunday at 8 a.m. We're there right before you go to church. So on your way to church and at church, you can listen to some commentary on fatherhood and hopefully that'll influence how you think about fathers and how you go about your day. Thank you so much and I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. You've been listening to I Am Dad podcast. We hope that you have been informed, encouraged you to think, or even inspired your heart for the love of dads. The conversation does not end here. Come back and join us next week. Same time, same place. Or you can continue the dialogue on our I Am Dad Facebook page. We also invite you to listen to past episodes, learn more about us, and keep up with special activities by visiting IamDadPodcast.com. That's IamDadPodcast.com. Until next time, I leave you with this reminder of manhood from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Because of this reminder, I will always understand that I am dad, period. period.